No, thank you all. Our final session here for AcuityCon. Um, and I mentioned it yesterday, and I just have to say it again. Um, so grateful for each of our friends who are up here on stage, because literally last week looked around and thought, you know what? This is so much better than if it's me and Matthew up here just boring you guys with stories. It's pretty entertaining. Though. It is kind of entertaining. You can, you can tune in on our YouTube channel and watch us do that anytime you want to do. But um, in looking at our friends who came here with us, it just dawned on us like, wow, these are all people who've been in the industry for a long time. And again, I know Letitia and I talked about it a little bit yesterday. I called them the veteran panel. But as we looked at it, like we have folks who've been, I think, almost all of this group since the 90s. Sorry to date, date everyone there. A long time in the accounting technology industry who are here with us. This is the place that we care deeply about. And it just felt like this is a much better opportunity while they're here and they came to spend time with us to get their take on things that have been happening within the industry, where things are going. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But first, if you would, please, big round of applause for all our panelists for this one. We are so grateful for y'all. Um, I'm going to start with an initial, an initial question that I will ask everybody. I'm going to start kind of picking the individual people. But this one I want everyone to answer and give a little bit of kind of like the origin story, and that is none of the four of you are actually accountants, I don't think, or ever got an accounting degree, yet you've been in the industry for so long. Like, why did you pick accounting technology without an accounting degree? What kind of what kept you in it? And through that, if you wouldn't mind, just how'd you get into accounting? What made you stay? So um, I'm just going to move in, in sequence here so that I can remember what's happening here. So Mike, Lead off, right. lead off here. I'll, I'll lead off. Um, no, no accounting degree. It was actually an English lit degree at UC Berkeley with an emphasis in Shakespeare. <laughs> Perfect sense. Perfect sense. <laughs> um, so what got me into the accounting industry, this goes back to my Trinet days. So I was chief revenue officer at Trinet for close to 12 years. Um, we had the unique opportunity at Trinet to focus on a couple unique channels. Um, one was venture capital, um, SaaS technology companies. And so I got to spend a lot of time with a lot of VCs. Um, but the way I kind of looked at it was um, when we started looking at other channels and verticals, the way we kind of looked at it at Trinet, and this is kind of what propelled me into the accounting industry for many years, uh, who's the closest advisor to the small business entrepreneur? That's really what it gets down to. And who has the biggest impact from an advisory standpoint? And so that's what got me really excited about the accounting uh, industry. And I've been in it um, for the last 25 years. Um, so that's what got me <laughs> into it. So. And so again, just for, we put them up there quickly the other day, but real quick, so Trinet also now at Mike, you met him upstairs with Giraffe. Gusto for a while, so you've seen. I mean, you've been through a lot of the big players in the space. So, yep, trying it for 12 years. Co founded another company by the name of Zoom In with yep. my executive team at Trinet, and then off to Gusto, and then now Giraffe. Awesome, thanks, Mike. Uh, David Leary, now, I you're are you hot? You're always come on, you're all you're always hot, Leary. I mean, when are you when are you not I only run a podcast? I yeah, don't know how exactly. to use a mic. <laughs> Wow, there's video here. What's happening? Um, all right, Leary. People think you're an accountant sometimes, but apparently you're not. Definitely What's not up with an that? accountant. I mean, I, I think this industry, I remember like my junior high school, and I think I was in like a class with seniors, like senior algebra or trig or whatever it was, and all the seniors graduated, and I had like that week of by myself with just the teacher. And she showed me Microsoft Excel, and like I was like, whoa, so this is like 1991. And it then, wasn't even Lotus one two three. No, it was okay. like Excel on a Mac, believe it or not, right? Ooh. And then I was like, "This is amazing." And then you know, I go to college and took an accounting one one. I was like, "This is easy," but at the same time, like, I didn't have the discipline for the rest of college, <laughs> so it didn't really work out. Okay. I was actually uh, working at the mall selling boxed software. There's uh, you know, software, et cetera, Babbage's. I was working at the mall, and I remember selling Quicken. Into I was kind of like in a way the first pro advisors, like the. the Mall sales employees were selling Quicken, and Intuit was just really good at like educating you about Quicken, and then you would sell boxed Quicken, and then it went from there to uh, 
they went bankrupt because Best Buy came and undercut them. And now same thing, Amazon's doing to Best Buy. And I wound up at Intuit taking tech support calls for QuickBooks DOS. So I spent 22 years at Intuit. I figured out once it was like 44% of my entire life was at Intuit. <laughs> Just like it's, I don't know if that's I think, depressing. I I, does, that that include, I does that include sleeping hours, David? Sleeping hours. Hey, David, yes. I think I bought one of those boxes from you. So yeah, and, and I remember when QuickBooks DOS, uh, DOS product was in retail, and I sold the first versions of QuickBooks way back in the day, and it just took off. Like into it, just got really lucky. Like Quicken drove QuickBooks, right? But then QuickBooks kind of drove everything. Even what, what we were here, right? You were a QuickBooks desktop firm. Like we all exist because of Intuit and QuickBooks at some level. But yeah, outside of this industry, I have no skills. <laughs> like, I, I, that's, like, I can't leave now. I have to stay in this industry. You have to stay? I mean, you couldn't help us if we needed to go to the mall again and buy box software? Is I could like work that? at Home Depot. Okay, okay. That's, that, 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 there that's you go. the dream. Hey, that's, right? that is the dream. That is Depot. the dream. Awesome, awesome. All right, Letitia. I, and by the way, I have to give a quick preface. Like, I, well, I don't want to oversell it, but I love when we talked a little bit about what you brought in the industry. Y'all are going to just, if you haven't met her, you're going to... All, and especially all, you, all the accounting team, I love what... No pressure. No pressure at all. I love... Anyway, so I'm so grateful for Letitia. Larry, last minute, I'm like, hey, we've never met. Do you mind getting up on stage? And, and then when I heard your origin story, it just really impacted me. So... Sorry for the big buildup. Yeah, wow. I mean, no <laughs> pressure with all these guys around me. Uh, and, and just for the record, from the veteran intro that happened there, I uh, started at 15. So let's just That's right, there. yeah. So let's just, just go on that assumption that I started <laughs> in software at 15. Got it? You know, 15. Uh, okay. Now she's getting into her 20s. And yeah, so she's there very, you very go. Better. Let's, That's let's just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I started one of the... Very similar to you. I stayed at one of the software vendors for a very long time. I spent 19 plus years uh, at Sage. And so I literally started in customer service. And so my, my joy was more around, oh, I can help people. That's super exciting. Then I ended up in the partner program area. And with that partner program, accountants, bookkeepers, influencers, advisors, it became a little bit of a passion for me because I'm all about the underdogs, right? I mean, in those larger companies, it's the, soft, it's the software itself, the small business side of things, but it's like, who actually runs the small businesses? Who gets, it's the glue. Who are the folks that make it happen? And that's the accountants and bookkeepers. And so your influence and the way by which you're able to influence the decision and be that advisor and be trusted by those small businesses, that was important to me. So for me, accounting became more of a, a purpose-driven uh, because what you do, you have to have passion about it. I mean, I know some of these clients can't be that great, right? I mean, <laughs> I know they don't just want to switch over right away. I know people are still using Excel, even though we've shown them there are so many efficiencies and what we can do with the solutions that we build now. But you guys still work with them. And that's amazing to me. And so that's passion-driven work. And for me, being able to work and partner with you guys, it matters a lot. So that's a part of my origin. But at Sage for a very long time, then I'm, I'm now at zero. So let's talk about zero just a little bit, just the love around the Absolutely. people and the, the human approach and the human touch. That's what we bring. That's what we do at zero, but that's what you guys bring. And that makes it that much better for me. So being at an organization where culturally within the organization, we care about people and humans, you guys already do that. And so it's a great Mary to be able to be a part of what that looks like. So that's what this journey is about for me. Oh, see, I, and I tell you, like, I want, mic well, drop. yeah, mic drop. Sorry, sorry about this, Jamie. You know, but like, I, I was like, I need, to talk, yeah, I, need, like, I need to talk to you all the time because I'm like, I've never felt better about being an accountant after talking to Letitia. I just love that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know, Jamie, if you've heard of Zero, the company that um, Letitia's at. I mean, maybe tell us a little bit about how, uh, yeah. <laughs> Zero is a big part of my story. Um, so our I, I, I'm known as one of the Jamies, the, the less funny, older, taller Jamie. Uh, and uh, our first software company, Better Jamie, was uh, in charge of all the ops in the back office, and, and we hated our bookkeeper. And so uh, when that was all over, he, he got to leave earlier, and he's like, i got to start something that makes that whole analog process digital. Um, and so HubDoc was his idea, and he, he kind of lured me into that in 2011. He's like, just come and work on it for six months. And he was like, I was like, I'm not stupid. You're lying to me. <laughs> uh, and, and so we built HubDoc together and um, had a deep partnership with Zero, obviously. But the, the best part of that journey was the relationships we built with firms like, uh, like Catching Clouds and Acuity, who became 
you know, they made our product better. They, they, they helped us grow. And um, I'm just, I feel fortunate based on the relationships I've had in the industry. Uh, we worked so closely with Zero. Um, we decided to merge with them in 2018. I spent a year and a half um, kind of working on the core product there, which was like one of the best learning experiences I've ever had. Um, COVID came and then I, I stepped away from the industry for a while and then David, he kept pulling me back in. Uh, so I'll tell you more about the next part of the journey uh, a little bit later. Awesome, awesome, thanks y'all. So again, great, I mean, there's just so many places we can go with this, but uh, a few questions. I wanna go back to Letitia. Um, We've all talked about partner programs, and really all of you have been in roles or are in roles now that focus on this channel or this partner of accountants. What, what have you seen that's changed? I mean, again, you mentioned all your time at Sage, and it sounds like even though you came through customer success, it was always folks on accountants. What's, what's changed at this point over the 19, 20 years or so um, in partner programs and for accounting firms like us? Great question. So it's an actual partner program. I think the difference is it's not just words on paper. And so partnering, it, it means more now than just being able to say, oh, I'm partnered with this firm or I'm partnered with this software vendor. It's actually that relationship and the more than just your name on a website or something like that, it's the marketing dollars that we can pour into you guys to, hope, to help you get that, that greater market share, that greater awareness of what you guys are doing, what your firms and what your businesses are doing. It's more about we're really partnering together, so relationship really matters. So we're not just saying, pay us a fee, give us some money, and then we'll figure it out later. It's like, no, 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 let's talk about the plan. Let's talk about the real partnership around what a partner program really looks like. So it's just more, it's deeper now. It's, it's better woven into the how we build better, how will we build bigger, how we build faster. So partnering really means partnering now. In the past, I don't know that it always meant partnering. We said it, but it was not always exactly what we meant. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a couple of things, but now we're like ingrained to what you do. We care about what you're saying. We wanna hear so we can make it better, so we can give you those things that benefit you most. We wanna make something too, don't get me wrong, but we also wanna make sure that you guys get something out of it. Absolutely, I think that's what we see with all of our partners who are here is that experience on the customer side, the small business side, when they say, hey, my accountants and Zero and Ada X and Giraffe, Emilio, they, they go, that combination of experience is so much more powerful when we're working together on that. I do agree with you. I think that's where we've seen partnership programs and the folks who are all here, that's, that's where we're all trying to get to serve clients with. So, and y'all have been awesome with that. Um, Leary. Um, tell me about your prediction for next week with the Bills. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about the Bills or football. Another shutout. Okay. Another <laughs> sh um, partner programs, but also with, with, you know, David, I think everyone knows this, but he didn't mention it. The Cloud Accounting Podcast, right, um, is... <laughs> it's a must listen. It's a must listen, right? <laughs> it's the number 2,038... I, Biggest podcast in the world. It's clearly the biggest one in our space. Now, I, whatever the stat was, you basically track and follow change in the industry, in technology. Um, beyond just the partner programs, like what, I don't know how you boil that kind of ocean down into like what is changing the most in the technology perspective. This is something you look at every week and I always love hearing about it. So I want to pick your brain on this on the stage a bit. What's changed the most in tech? I mean, it's weird because... I mean, like you said before, I started doing tech support for DOS. So I went from DOS to Windows, floppy disk to CD-ROM to cloud, right? And every, every like, time the technology changes, it's the barriers to entry go down. And really, if we think about how quickly you launched HubDoc, and you could just, anybody can just, A, launch an accounting firm now, pretty, fairly quickly, just go to Starbucks, get a laptop, you start an accounting firm. Apps can be created the same way. It's built on Amazon stack, it's off the shelf, they get a connection to Plaid, they get connections to QuickBooks data, and they just build an app. So it's easier than ever for accounts to get in this industry. It's easier than ever for apps to get in this industry, right? But the big thing that I think has changed, and I, I kind of felt like this was going to come, and I remember probably about six, seven, eight years ago. If you think about 25 years ago, a small business would start. The next day, they would go find an accountant, and the accountant would say, go to Costco or Office Depot and buy QuickBooks. Like, that was the path. Now... You, a client comes, a client starts a business, 
That's just their name of the client yet, right? They, it's a business owner. They start a business. They get a square dongle. They download five different apps on their phone. They're, they're running their business for a year. Then the accountant comes into the picture. And like, how do you get ahead to the other? How do you as an accountant and bookkeepers get ahead of that is the question. Because you're not in the conversation until it's a year in anymore. You used to be on the conversation on day one of the business. It's just because everything's easy, accessible. They just get on their phone and they're running their business. They don't need you until they need you. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I think we've seen that as a team, right? How often we're like, oh, isn't that nice? You know, isn't that nice when we get a client who comes to us right away? They're just starting the business and the books are all clean. That never happens. It never happens. It's like, oh, exactly like David mentioned. They've just plugged a bunch of things in, and then our sales team kind of gets it. You know, and they're looking through like, hey, we need to close this deal, but I think they've been running by themselves without tax returns or anything for the past couple of years. Onboarding team gets it, it's like, this is a nightmare. And then, then the rest of the team gets it like, oh my gosh. So it's exactly, I think as you described, David, which is, um, you know, we try to figure out how do we get out of that space? I'm not sure we can, right? I'm not sure it's possible. We have to learn how to adapt and maybe get them earlier on. But uh, and I do think it's that marriage and the partnership of us working together on this is how we try to get in front of it. But Mike, I mean, having been in working in partnerships for, for so long, um, I mean, I guess what, what to you, and again, I'm not asking for a commercial on acuity, but like when you think about it, part of the reason why we bring all of you here is because we do care about um, partnering with you and being the best that we can be as a partner, what, what do we as firms need to be doing to make ideal partnerships? I know, yes, we need to help move licenses. I know that it's part of it, really, it truly is. But what makes a great partner when you think about accountants or firms? You don't use QuickBooks desktop anymore? <laughs> no, sorry, that. Okay, cool. We get them off desktop. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think the first thing is, um, is, is there true strategic alignment? And that's... We have to unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the first thing that I think about in terms of what makes a great partnership here, um, and obviously Acuity is a fantastic partner of Giraffe, has been for a very long time. But you know, are we on the same page as it relates to the goals and objectives for the company, right, in the firm? And making sure that we create a plan to successfully get there together. I think that's the first thing. And we know that things shift from a priority standpoint um, within a firm and even within our company itself. And just making sure the second thing that I, I would say is just 100% transparency and open communication. Because you know things are gonna shift on our side, things are gonna shift from a priority on your side, and that's okay. You know, We just have to be open about it and making sure that we can continue to develop our plan together even though that may shift. Yeah. Those are the two things I think are the most important in a mutual partnership. Yeah. And, and it's, that's my real ask and plea to the Acuity team is, is to make sure we are transparent, we're communicating, things change. But that's how we actually work best with all of our tech stack partners, Jarab and the rest of them. And so it's why we bring them here. So I really ask, we have a tech stack team and Scott's doing some leadership around our technology, but it really is all of us individually. Let's create those relationships here and really lean in on that and be transparent and open with all of our tech stack partners. And so they, they want that. I think Mike's not, that's not lip service. We've worked with all of y'all for a long time. That's important um, to make sure they know what our needs are, our expectations are, but don't, we are so fortunate that we don't just go through a, support page, right? That we don't just go through a chat with our tech stack partners. We have names and faces. So be sure to make sure a team acuity, we reach out and really, really connect and develop that partnership deeper, like Mike mentioned. Sometimes uh, partnerships evolve in interesting ways to where you become such great partners. You just say, well, you know, maybe we should do things together. It sounds familiar with uh, Patty and Scott. Well, yeah, we like working together and partnering on things. Maybe we should just kind of, you know, unite things together. And so we're seeing a lot of M&A and things happen in the space. Um, from someone who's gone through a process like that, Jamie, what, um, talk a little bit about what that was like being merged into one of the real tech giants in the space. Do you see that continuing going forward? We see a lot of activity right now in firms 
technology companies, Bill.com, Divi, coming together. You were very early on in this. How do you see that progressing? What was that like? Uh, two different questions. So that there'll be more and more of it, right? Because um, software companies can't build all the things that, that customers want. And uh, customers want less products, not more, right? And so consolidation will be natural. Uh, and I think healthy, and if the products work together, it can be great. Uh, from a personal experience, I mean, uh, uh, we'd work closely with Zero from, from 2014. I always tell the story of how we built our, our relationship with Scott and Patty. We scraped the Zero directory and just started calling the ones at the top of the list, and uh, I think Scott uh, was our first customer. Um, uh, 20 bucks a month was the first payment. Thank you, Scott. Uh, <laughs> and. and uh, we, we were closely um, kind of participating in the Zero ecosystem uh, and, and the QuickBooks ecosystem. And David gave us great advice. I think the quote is, it all started with sushi. David and I and Jamie had a sushi lunch in Toronto in 2014. He was on his way to a Bills game. Uh, <laughs> and he gave great advice, which is just build products that solve problems and show up in the ecosystem and help out, right? And I think... Uh, that's the advice I'd give to kind of any software company in the account tech ecosystem, which is show up, help other people. And if your product isn't right for the firm or the person, just say, hey, try Melia or try something else, right? And um, if you solve problem for customers, eventually people notice. And uh, that's what happened with, with Zero and HubDoc. I think I could add on. Yeah, please. Matt, I think the one thing that I think is interesting is from a marketing standpoint, so it's like, oh, it's QuickBooks versus Zero. Don't talk to the Sage people and this and this. And it's like this battle, but it really doesn't need to exist. And like you having four different payroll companies here and six different bill payment apps here, and like you integrated with QuickBooks and you integrated with Zero. At one time, I tried to get Sage onto the QuickBooks app store. Like that's kind of that, that being agnostic to is better for the customer ultimately. Like if you're gonna have some clients that are in zero, you're gonna have some on QuickBooks and you're gonna have another client that likes this because of whatever reason. And if you can be flexible and be agnostic, it's better for everybody. Everybody gets to win. But like these closed mindsets that used to exist. I remember when QuickBooks desktop and ADP would not integrate with each other. So all the QuickBooks people had to pay a penalty, every payroll, because they would have, they were a good customer of ADP and a good customer of QuickBooks, but the customer paid the pain. They had to download a file, save it to their hard drive, import it to QuickBooks every single week for a decade until the companies got mature and said, why are we making our customers that are paying us have pain, right? And so being platform agnostic is really the best thing for the customer in the end, ultimately. It's interesting. I think Matthew and I were talking about this of where, dating ourselves back to when we started our career, you'd hear about someone who had a, they had their a custom accounting system. And that meant, oh, you're a Fortune 100 and using PeopleSoft or like, wow, they, they purpose built their own accounting system. Whereas now it's crazy to your point about everybody can have their own accounting system because I'm going to go, the business owner is going to go pick a platform, plug a bunch of things in, and they've essentially customized it. So it is a, it's a huge shift, I think, in the way the eco system ends up kind of working. And I've always found it interesting, I'll, I'll go back to Letitia on this one, is kind of relevant on the partners, but this ecosystem that we're in, right? I, I tend to think of it as we have the technology folks who help enable the work. We have the small business owners who are trying to help, and then us accountants are in there too. It's this interesting combination of us trying to work together to help the small business. What, what have you seen, I guess, around partner programs, or around accountants specifically? What's changed? Are we, and I don't, please be honest, I don't mind, uh, of our accountants, our piece of the ecosystem, are we less important today? Is it more important like to get the right technology out to the small business owner? Are we more important or is it all, how do, you, how do you look at that? And I think we, we understand that sometimes we as accountants probably get in the way because maybe sometimes we're not as agnostic as we should be. How, how do you, where do you think we as accountants stand today in the ecosystem? So I, I definitely can't say that you guys don't matter, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not in this audience, right? <laughs> it's okay, we're not gonna throw them. But I think, um, you know, in my opinion, I, uh, I do see that small businesses specifically, when they get to a point, they identify that they, there's a need, right? And with that need, it's like 
bookkeeper, accountant, it seems a little bit scary. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I got to bring someone in because I want to get this thing run through. I got to figure this thing out. And I think what we're learning and what I'm seeing is that uh, small businesses are becoming more reliant, especially with the climate that we're in right now. It's just more important to get it right the first time out the gate, right? We're going to fail at some point. Let's fail fast. But then once we fail, let's go right back to getting the right people on board so that we can have the proper ecosystem so that we can get things done. And so accountants and bookkeepers are more relevant, in my opinion, now than in the past, simply because mm. people are going to you guys more. You guys are trusted advisors. Know that. And, and be proud of that because it matters. And just because someone know, does, doesn't know that they need you, trust that they're going to need you. Because businesses are growing and growing at, at speeds that small businesses are growing at speeds that they're not even aware that they could have attained. And so you have to be available to them. So the accountants and bookkeepers are very important to the ecosystem right now, mm. more so than in the past, quite honestly. Love hearing that, right? We love hearing that, right? We're getting more important. And, and, and thank you for that. I do think it's it, it's so mindful for us to remember that. Sometimes we think that, you know, our clients are making decisions without that. They are trusting us to help advise them, give them advice about when the right solutions fit. So I appreciate you emphasizing that, Letitia. Um, I guess maybe as we think about the ecosystem, there are more than just us three players. I feel like lately, and I know part of it is a little bit of our heritage at Acuity, we work with tech startups. We're in the tech village we see a lot of outside investors who are starting to look at the space. Private equity, you know, is getting pretty active in the space. Venture capital has been coming on a lot more. Um, Mike, I, I mean, you're, well, there's a few folks here who have outside investors, venture capital. What, what do we, what is your feeling about the role that outside investors like venture capital or private equity kind of play in the space? Helpful, distracting. There's maybe a couple, few of those, and I may ask a few other folks that are thinking, but I want to start with you on VCs in the space. I'm, I'm gonna, can I add on to this question? Though? Yeah, yeah, please. Can you explain it on two fronts? Because I think historically apps have taken VC money, right. but this whole like accounting firms taking private equity and VC money is like only about three weeks old. It is and so weird. like, if you can answer it on both of those fronts. I may ask you Matthew to give, uh, he's got an interesting take on that too, but seriously, yeah, Mike, I think you've, you've seen a lot of this. Well, I, I think from the venture capital standpoint, it, there's there's a big distinction between the VC side and the private equity side, um, and so let's let's kind of tease that out just a little bit. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're seeing just a ton of venture funding into the account tech space right now, and you see that with companies like Pilot, like Bench, and in others, and you know, it's kind of dovetails into the earlier question about you know, the relevancy of the, of the bookkeeping and accounting piece, right? Um, there's gonna be a lot more automation um, and where the value comes in is taking that data and advising on that data. That's where the trend's gonna be. Um, but from a VC standpoint, you know, the, the philosophy there is, is much different than private equity. You know, their funds are gonna be anywhere between, you know, call it seven, eight years um, that they want to get liquidity on their funds. And so that's kind of the time horizon investment that they want to see and get their IRR. On the private equity side, what I think is kind of unique right now is that um, they tend to have a little bit longer horizon from um, the return on their investments. And so they're looking at 10 to 12 years in some cases, and usually they're going to be selling it off to another private equity firm, right? So the investment in Eisner Amper is pretty interesting um, from a structure standpoint. I think it it could be the beginning of a trend of additional private equity coming into the accountant community. I think the secret sauce around that's gonna be what technology layers can the accounting firms create to create scale through acquisitions through advisory services? Because I think that's what's gonna go ahead and create the right scale the right acquisition strategy moving forward in the industry. So this is going to be really interesting to watch on the private equity side to see what Eisner is able to do with this investment and how they're going to go ahead and execute the investment over the next several years. And there will be plenty of acquisitions that they roll up, but how they integrate those and, um, and create IP around it, I think is going to be really key. Do you think that everybody's going to sit on the sidelines and wait and see how this takes eight years? Or do you think they're just going to, oh, they did it, and you're just going to see a big flood of everybody racing in as fast as possible because they don't want to miss out. Well, if they did it, they must know something. 
I don't think so in this case. I, I think there's going to be fewer private equity firms coming in right now to see. They're going to see how this thing plays out. Um, that's what I believe. Um, this one's a little bit unique from my perspective. Interesting. Yeah, Jamie? I just want to take a swing at the pilot bot keeper benches of the world. I, I don't believe the automation story. I believe firms like Acuity and the best accounting firms are actually people businesses and professional services Woo! firms. Um, <laughs> and those businesses, folks, are hard to scale. They're not as good as software businesses. Like software companies have 85% gross margins because you know, there's no cost of goods sold. The cost of goods sold for what you guys do is your time and, and, and energy. Um, I make products and y you guys make a product too, which is for the small business owner, I was saying to Kenji, I could sell what you do all day long, right? Uh, 15 grand a year, 20 grand a year, real-time reconciled books and a tax return. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to hire a finance person. That's 20 grand for no finance department. That's incredible. Uh, and you're incented to, to leverage te technology to drive as much automation as you can. But I love bookkeepers and the bookkeeping work is boring, but it's also uh, driven by exception. And I built computers to extract data from invoices and receipts at HubDoc and that worked 80% of the time. What do you do with the other 20% of the time? Um, maybe there's a labor arbitrage opportunity uh, with, with you know, India, Philippines, whatever, who can do that basic virtual you know, repeatable work, but uh, I think the hundreds of millions that have gone into these automated bookkeeping plays are, are going to be left with not a lot of returns for their investors. Um, and, you know, on the private equity side, again, back to what you do as a people business, a professional services business, what, where are the cost savings or revenue synergies from rolling up 10 of these firms? Um, I just don't know. Like the the key part of your business and where I think Kenji and Matthew um, are different from many other firms on the planet is the focus on people and building an amazing people experience for working here, and that translates for great customer service. And I can't remember, but I met the recruiter here today. I've never met another accounting firm with a recruiter anywhere, uh, and that's a focus on building the whatever the human capital business bullshit term is. Uh, it's the people who do the work every day and building a team and a culture here so you can deliver for clients. And technology will help you do that, but it's never going to automate everything away. Absolutely. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah. Well said. Yes, very well. Do you, have, do you have more well to say? Uh, yeah. well, well, no, it's, it's just, uh, it makes me all warm and fuzzy on the inside. That's just kind of who I am as a person. But that relationship building, the human aspect of it all, you have to touch people. And, and, and you cannot touch people with machines. And that's just a real thing. You know, and so I think well said. It's just that that human touch, the way the relationships are built, it matters more than anything in this climate right now that we're in. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to ask two more questions. I want you all to be, I know there's questions out there. Be thinking of them. Um, and I'm going to flip it back to folks that have questions. So I'm going to be thinking of them. I'm going to come to you all next. Um, I guess my first question, I'll get kind of granular and specific. We're talking about investors and big things happening in the space. I feel like here in Atlanta, where we are, um, we really focused a lot on what happened with Intuit and MailChimp recently, right? So, um, Again, I think it impacted us more because it shook some of us. Like, that was a company that we thought I could not even imagine being in this space that they went to and to it. Yet in thinking and hearing about, you know, you and Blake talk on the, on the podcast of where, you know, maybe deeper thinking around that, I guess I need a little bit of some soothing on this because I held them up as MailChimp as heroes and as icons of like, yeah, we're not going to go investors. We're not going to go. And now they're part of Intuit. Um, I, help, help me out here, Leary, or anyone else. Like, is this a good or is this a bad thing? Are they, are they, is that going to help small business owners? Ultimately, is this problematic? That they're just becoming this big. What's, what are you thinking? So as a former Intuit folk, you're probably not on any kind of NDA anymore. Are you? From no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it was weird when I first saw the announcement and yeah. then I went into the MailChimp founders, uh, Twitter feed 
And he has like his third tweet in, like, oh, we just launched e-commerce stores and we spun up 40,000 of them in four months. And I was like, that's why Intuit bought you. They wanted e-commerce yes, stores. Yes, oh, That is why they did it. They wanted e-commerce stores. But then you start poking around on MailChimp's website and like, oh, they got like a scheduling program, which accountants could use to schedule meetings. They have a, it's like eight acquisitions in one. But the real key here, and this is why it's important to accounts and bookkeepers, is MailChimp has 16 million small businesses. That's 16 million more small businesses. I mean, there's probably some overlap yeah. that Intuit can now put in front of accountants and bookkeepers. And I would be spinning up an SEO, MailChimp, CPA.com website <laughs> landing page. Like, I would be creating content. Like, this is a lot of brand new small business owners. And not only that, I think MailChimp has their own like MailChimp experts that are like marketing experts, right? So now you, the small business owners, like there's a lot of overlap. You could start offering, you could probably hire some MailChimp employee now, come work for your firm, and you could offer marketing services in your accounting firm, all tied back to QuickBooks and, you know, full circle. Hey, not only will it, we will help you track marketing and that marketing data is going to move into a sale and that sale is going to go into QuickBooks. I think it's a lot of opportunity for accounts and bookkeepers, but it makes sense why Intuit bought it. Like you really look at the portfolio and it's like, oh, check, 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 check. makes a lot more sense than other acquisitions Intuit's made in the past. <laughs> yeah. True. Jamie, what do you think? Uh, well, in my time at Zero, which uh, I ran a big piece of product strategy, and we, we looked at the wheel of services that small business consume, right? And so um, Intuit makes a GL. Uh, there's a payroll service, and it's like HRIS would be interesting. Uh, what else do SMBs um, consume? How do we add value for them? And CRM's one of them. And effectively, MailChimp's a CRM solution for SMBs, right? It allows them to track their customer bases and communicate with them. So I think strategically it fits. Uh, the, the sense of loss that one feels in an ecosystem when one of the, the white knights um, becomes part of the Borg. Nobody likes that feeling. Uh, it, it is what it is. But it's, you know, um, <laughs> normally I'd say like all the MailChimp employees who made money, but only three of them did, uh, <laughs> would, would go on and start new companies now. But, um, and I think that'll happen anyway, right? So um, th those are good things. It's new seeds are going to be planted from this. I, I appreciate that because I think you're, you're tapping into my and probably a number of ours feelings about that is that they had this kind of white knight to them. And, and, and again, I love Matthew's take on this when we talked on, on Drink What You Think the other week about um, thinking a little further about that of going, oh, we just, you know, not just me being upset, like, oh, I lost one of my hero companies who's now part of the big Borg was thinking further downstream of, okay, wait a minute. What can this actually do longer term in the ecosystem? And I think I, I'm reminded about where the place that we're in right now, the Atlanta Tech Village and David Cummings, who built this when he sold Pardot ultimately into what ended up being Salesforce. And he went back and invested in this community and there's more startups getting more help. I think that's probably the hope we've had for what the folks there at MailChimp will do. We, we hope not just to see the, the, the MailChimp yacht, you know, just sailing around out somewhere else. And I know that comes back as part of the ecosystem here. So that is... The hope, but I, I, if that also helps soothe me of not thinking, oh, wait a minute, they just, we lost them to the big Borg. Um, so uh, th thanks for answering that. It's just an interesting topical thing that's happening here in Atlanta. It felt like we had to hit that. I guess I'll wrap with this one, and then I want to get questions from y'all. Um, thinking kind of about the future of where the industry is going, I'm curious as to what you all would think about from as whether – you're investing in the space or what you think is going to be hot spots within the space. And maybe it's a company that you're like, oh, if I could invest in them, I would do it. Or in a segment like of our space where, where you would go and lay a bet, right, uh, in this space. Who would, who would you bet on? Who would you bet on or what part of our accounting ecosystem do you think is going to be more valuable in the future? I'll let whoever wants to jump in first just take it, and then we'll get questions going. So, but I want to hear from all of y'all about where are we going. If I if we could write a check today, where should we place it? Whatever the Jamie's build next might be a <laughs> like I proven agree with that. tracker I agree with twice, that. right? 
I always I always talk my own book, so I'm I'm wearing an A2X T-shirt <laughs> and I, and I and I wrote a check there. So I believe in e-commerce. I think every business is going to be e-commerce merchant, and uh, they're, they're they're all going to need help with the revenue reconciliation. And the other part of my book that I'm excited about is a company called Relay. Uh, banking sucks for small businesses everywhere, and Yusuf's a hub dog, and he's building an awesome company. Great company. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Who else? Larry, where are you? Where are you? We're gonna bet these days. I think like for your retirement, long term, slow and steady. You go long on Intuit. You go long on Zero. You go long on Square. Like long, 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 long on those guys. But like as far as like an interesting start to me, there's a company called Check that's basically building payroll APIs. Like every niche app's like Clio Law Firm software, B, uh, BQE uh, software that's for. Uh, uh, architect companies, they're all just gonna have payroll built in through these APIs in the same way they have Stripe APIs built into their apps. And I think that's a very interesting company to me. Is uh, They're basically doing stuff I wanted to do at Intuit a decade ago with payroll. You know, awesome. Just awesome. payroll APIs. Mike, what do you think? Um, I'm going to go with what David said. Uh, the <laughs> Square would be the investment right mm -hmm. now. Um, I believe that you know with their stack that they're creating around the whole small business ecosystem. Um, I think they're really onto something. All right, Letitia, give us the, yeah, yeah. What's that? Acuity on Invest the table? Invest in acuity? Uh, no, we're a people-based business. We're not taking, you know. Okay, well, what, was that, what size check are you talking about here, Leo? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, Emilio, apparently, uh, it seems like you guys, you have some funds laying around these days. How big was the raise a few weeks announced? 500 million. 500 million? Whoa, whoa, that was almost a mic drop. Yeah. Huge there, that's, you know. Amelia, we should be looking at too. Uh, Letitia, what, what either company or part of the space is going to become more valuable in your opinion? So I'm, I'm going to be completely politically correct. So I'm going to say bet on yourself. I think pay attention to what's happening in the market. Pay attention to all the things that are happening at all the big, the big places, zero included, right? But bet on yourself. Continue to educate yourself. Continue to build. Continue to be aware of what technology is happening out there. Pay attention to your customers, your clients. They're kind of weird sometimes, but just pay attention. They, they kind of know what they're doing. But pay, bet on yourself. Pay attention to what's happening just around podcasts, all the cool things that are going on, the people that you know in the ecosystem. But bet on yourself. Start there. Oh, love that. Love it. Um, I, I told y'all, I'm going to feel better. Just like, let's, Letitia, can we get your bookie here next week? And um, all of you, I mean, again, I, we, I could do this. This is why Matthew and I do this. Every, every week we want to talk to our friends and, and get wisdom and insight. Uh, this has been so valuable. I'd love to get some questions. I know you all have questions. There may be even some online if Matthew's checking those. But y'all, give these folks some questions that you want to you want them to dig in on. I know they'll answer anything for you. So where can we go first? I warmed you up. I told you it was coming. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Matthew's like, okay, I've got five of them I want to ask, but he's, come on. Y'all, I know there were folks out late last night, <laughs> me included. Come on. What do we got? You all look so cozy, though. I mean, from this Yeah, view. Lee. Yeah, no, Lee, yeah. Most, so the question was, for those online, and Lee asked this great question, looking back 20 years, asking us all to date ourselves. Thanks, Lee. Now, uh, <laughs> um, what would we be most shocked about now, looking back 20 years ago, that's changed in, in the industry and overall? Is that, okay, oh, awesome. I, I was afraid this is going to be like a personal no. thing. That you can make it that go. way. I may ask you that later, Larry. All right. That the Bills actually have a good team? Okay, that, that's probably yeah, true. That might be the mic drop right there. <laughs> All right, what do you, you want to you jump on that one first, Larry? What's, what are you most shocked by now looking, if you were to look back and tell yourself, you're not going to believe this just happened? I, I, I think the money in this space is probably the most shocking. Mm. Like the, it went from like $99 box of QuickBooks to bananas. And it's even just from like two or three years ago. I mean, do you guys had an exit to um, zero for like 70 million? It, Sage bought. It felt Sage, like a lot at the time. Sage, <laughs> think about this. Sage bought, Sage, Sage bought Intact 
for $700 million. Sage Intact was only $700 million. It's bananas. And then you look at the money now. And then even like uh, Intuit just sponsored the new Clippers place. They're calling it the Intuit Dome. They paid $500 million to do a 23-year sponsorship. But even that, five years ago, you could sponsor a stadium for $100 million. <laughs> like things are just bananas. The money is just insane that's being just thrown on everywhere. Yeah. Like that's yeah. like you didn't see that 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was like you bought a $99 piece of software and you used it for three years. I feel like that's one of the key reasons of one wanting to hear you and Blake just as, as friends and just you know, it's fun to hear you guys talk each week. But I'm like, I feel desperate to like, I got to keep up with what's happening and it's changing so fast and the money's been crazy. Is It's one of the reasons why it's soon. I'm like, I just have to figure out like what new huge deals happen in the space because it is happening so rapidly. So yeah, I, lo I love that. That's, a, that's, a, that, that's one I don't think many of us saw coming. Um, others, what, what else? I mean... What other things do you think has happened that you're just shocked by now that you would have been shocked at 20 years ago? I would say just um, the workforce dynamics that have happened. Um, that would be the most shocking thing. The ability to work from home and do all these things that we can do today, that's probably the biggest thing that has changed um, and I'd be most shocked about back then. It, I think even with the, the one blessing that has happened with, with COVID was is forcing companies to really make tough, really great decisions about their people, um, about working from home, about true work-life balance, and, and that's, that, that would be the one thing I would turn to, yeah. Love that, love that, yeah. What else? I mean, the only thing I'd say is I'm a, I'm a tech optimist and um, I just believe in the power of software, especially to kind of, well, whatever Mark Andreessen said, eat the world, which is uh, kind of what it's done. So th I, I think the surprising thing for me is like um, the negative impact of technology on humanity in some dimensions. So, you know, pick on social media as an example to, to kind of divide us all as people. Um, which is, it's just accelerating it. I mean, the division was probably already there, but uh, that, that makes me sad and surprised me if I went back 20 years ago, I was like, software is just good. It's gonna make everything digital and better and faster and I'm gonna be able to tap my phone or whatever. Um, so that part makes me a little sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What are you most shocked about, Patricia? I know you guys could all recall the, the huge resistance to putting things in the cloud, things being online. And, and now we're having this conversation. I can't see it, where is it? Why is it not yet? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you're gonna put my books in the cloud? You know, and, and we still have some of that, don't get me wrong, right? But, but the shock that they're, the adoption, it is speeding up and it sped up at a pace that was very surprising to me because there was such resistance to the idea. It's like, no way, this is my important information. These are my books, this is my payroll, it cannot happen. And we still hear that today, don't get me wrong. But the idea that there's so much of a open mindset that's happening. So, so, there's, so the desktop accounting podcast is not overtaking the cloud accounting podcast, Larry? They're not, you know? <laughs> But it, that's a really good one because that, I remember that's a good idea for a new pod, though, <laughs> just to punk Blake and David. We should start the desktop accounting no, it, podcast. Somebody did. It's already oh, been pranked. Uh, it happened already. It's Brittany Brown. Oh, she created Brittany, a fake one. Yeah. So, so it's already happened. But going back to the resistance, I remember like Intuit would we go to conferences and we'd give out luggage tags, like, join us to the cloud. Like, <laughs> like I'm so glad, like, none of us have to do that anymore. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was an exhausting conversation. It really was. It was. And I, you know, that, that's looking forward now. I think we're all thankful that we're not having to, I mean, again, all the team, I think Tyler, I mean, probably had to, like, explain to people for so long. No, no, we have to do, we can only do your bookkeeping if it's, on Zero, or if it's on QuickBooks Online, and, and that was, people are like, no, no, sorry, I need to be able to see my server that it sits on, and that's changed, <laughs> thankfully. Um, what, y'all, no, what a quick, yes, so, shout it out, and I'll repeat it for the first one. So the, the, the question was, we look back 20 years, we're looking forward 20 years. What's, 
you know, some of we alluded to around some of those longer term bets on specific companies, but yeah, maybe speaking, yeah, right. Where, where do we think the industry is going to be in 20 years? Some prognostication here. We won't hold you to it, but you know, we're interested to hear what you think. I think all the apps are going to be free. All the apps are going to be free. It, the data is more valuable. It's like Facebook. Like, you, I think all the apps are going to be free. Like, I think there's going to be a march to that. I hope not. This is my home, my home Depot plan here. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, okay, interesting. Three. Okay, well, we'll hold you to that, David. Um, no, no, that, that is interesting. Yeah. What else? Other things you think that we're maybe not thinking of? That's, a, that's an unusual one. I just said uh, this is a sob to your business partner, Matthew. Uh, I'm like, I spend all my time reading about um, decentralization and blockchain, and I'm not much interested in speculation or, or Bitcoin as a replacement for gold or whatever, but I think the idea of uh, computers um, being able to prove something and it being a public record, uh, this idea of transparency and, you know, you can think of um, a ton of applications in the accounting world. I don't think they're coming anytime soon, but I'm excited about um, what decentralization and blockchains can unlock uh, across all business and, and humanity. Mm. Mm. Any others there? Cool. So, so Dale, yeah, yeah. Um, for those online, thanks, Jody, for that last question. It was awesome. Dale, uh, where do you think AI, where do we think AI is going to have a role in the space is the question. So, all right. Scott's probably going to jump up on stage and go, oh, can I please answer <laughs> RPA? There'll be a separate talk about that. But where's AI going to? Jamie's the expert. He tried to build this before. Please, please tell us. Well, I, I think invoice extraction and <laughs> AP extraction is a it's a solved problem now, right? Um, if anyone wants to build a company, there's uh, just make an API out of that and sell it to Bill.com and Zero and Intuit, so they don't have to all do it themselves, and you can amass the data. And I think there's a interesting business there. Um, I'm not bullish on like AI solving every automation problem in accounting, as you heard earlier. Uh, I think. Um, the models are expensive to build. They take a lot of time. You got to build the data asset, and and so uh, it's likely to be concentrated in the in the largest software companies with the most data, where we see the most value. And I'm excited about that for Tesla and Apple and Google and Facebook. But you know, I'm less bullish on like zero into its ability to harness AI to drive a bunch of customer value. But we'll see. Agree. Anyone want to jump in and? pile on or dispute or we're gonna let Jamie be our voice of authority. <laughs> Turn to Jamie. Yeah, any other thoughts on that? Otherwise I'll take more more questions. Matthew? You gonna wrap up? Okay. Can I ask well, one yeah. more question before you yes, wrap you up? Yes, you can. One more question. I asked Kenji this at the bar last night. So Kenji is oh the CEO. Oh no. right, he's a CEO. And I've been around a lot of CEOs and leaders and managers and a lot of times they like they should be regurgitating like the last management book they talked about or read. Or, and so I just asked Kenji because it doesn't come off that way. And I'm just like, how Kenji? How are you CEO Kenji? Like, what drives you? Where, you? where do you get advice from? Who mentors you? Like, like how are you doing this? Yeah, I, um, I, I hate that you asked me this now and I have to kind of speak it in front of Matthew. Um, <laughs> and, and we've talked about it, you know, Jamie, and you've met – the other shorter, funnier, more talkative, however you describe him. Um, the ability to have partners, and Patty and Scott and Lisa and Matthew, um, has been so helpful. That's where I, I, I have to lean on. I, I learned that about myself, that I'm actually, I'm just not great. I'm not, I'm not just the best me if I'm just by myself doing that. I tried that. I, you know, Acuity, I ran Acuity for about a year by myself. Matthew absolutely remembers. He tells the story about how, when he joined, what shape we were in, we were in bad shape. I was trying to do a little bit of everything, and I'm not, I'm just not good by myself. And so I always, um, and, and this especially, you know, so Matthew has been so instrumental and helpful there. Then it was my wife, who's an entrepreneur and is amazing. And so I just try to tell folks that, like, just, if you can just judge me based on the company that I keep, this room included my spouse, my 
partners, the people here. That makes me happy. Just look who I try to surround myself with. And that's where I have to go because so many people helped last year. We had tough discussions and conversations here. Derek and I talked about this a lot last night of where leaning into um, just having those conversations. And, and, and I, I guess I'll touch on and maybe we'll wrap up with this. I appreciate that question, David. That's where I go for inspiration and for help is for all of you. Um, but, you know, something that Jamie mentioned a minute ago about being – um, thinking about where social media and things have gone right. And a lot of us are parents of teenagers or kids who are at that stage. And I think I, I know I obsess and worry about that. And something that dawned on me and it, it's that you mentioned, and I think about what this was intended to be right here is we've always said at Acuity that good discussions, great conversations don't happen in large audiences, right? If the smaller, more intimate the group, the better the conversation. And, and I do, and that worries me about things like social, right? That's not a conversation. You can't have that, and I think we see that, and that's challenging when we forget that or we see our kids forgetting that that's not a conversation with someone that's too big of an audience. The great, meaningful discussions happen in intimate, small conversations, and I'm thankful for all the times I had to bend his, his ear on things or the conversations we've had together in this conversation right here with our friends who've been able to come in and have a small, intimate conversation with us. Because that's actually where the good discussions happen, is in smaller circles, not out in the big world of things like social media. So um, I'm just very, very grateful and thankful for all of you here. Give it up to our panelists who are amazing. Thank you all so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Matthew, come on up. Yes. Support. Everyone look under your chair. There's a new iPhone. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. You get a car. <laughs> All right. More good so, swag coming. Given, you, so whoever wants to do the Avalara one. I so Avalara is getting in on the game. Oh, okay. So Avalara, if you're not familiar with it, uh, automates sales tax, and there's a nice little sticker here with an amazing gift card in it, $100. Oh, all right. All right, Jamie, who gets the... Uh, Jamie. Oh, it's uh, Nita Mystery. Nita! Woo! All right. Come on down. <laughs> all right, let's keep them coming. What's next? Okay. Well, there, are there more there to give away? Yeah, there's lots. There's lots? Oh, sorry. Are, are, we, are we keeping them all up here? We're making yeah, them? Okay. We're, making them do it. we're getting into the fun. We have no idea what they're getting. All right. You have to be present to win. Just to let y'all know. You're not here. Rabia Nafi. Rabia! Woo! Woo! All right. Yeah! Up next, Leary. How many more do we keep? Do you, if you if you ever knew how many times Blake has to edit the podcast because I see people's names incorrect, like I'm, no apologizing. Let's go. Derek Williams. Derek. V. Will. I oh, know. I can't. He's. Divi's gonna get on the deal. Divi's gonna get on the deal. This is a fifty dollars Amazon gift card, right? Have to be present to win. Here we go. AirPods. First. AirPods. This is huge. Oh, AirPods what? is coming. AirPods is coming. Big, big. <laughs> the fifty dollars gift card. Okay, so we got your number is nine seven three eight one six zero seven one nine. Bingo. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, you have to check okay. your thing. Oh, Damani. Damani, come on down. I'm not sure. Kelly's just getting. Give him the... All right, Mike. What do we got? All right. Uh, Steve Honold. Where's Steve? Steve here? Steve Honold. Steve, you had to be, he was here somewhere. Did he escape? He escaped. All right, we'll go to the next one here. You got to be here to win. I know this person's here. Because she asked a great question earlier. Jody Kelly. Woo! <laughs> We're going to do two from Debbie again. 4704936214. The robot has Ooh, won John. again. All right. <laughs> Next one. my cell phone number. I was uh, give that out. Oh, wait, wait. 404-606-2338. Woo! Yay! Woo! 
How many do we have left? Three more. Mike, no, we got Mike. Mike can get the Oh, Mike didn't get, give one? Okay, hold on. So he, got, he's got he gets to, a he's new one. He's got to give one before we go to Jamie. Okay. That's a good one. All right. Amy Ryan. Amy Ryan. Where is it? Oh, is she Amy was. Amy here. Oh, oh, she left. Oh, no. Get Come go. on, Mike. All Mike, right. what are you doing here, Mike? You're. Snooze, you lose. <laughs> this person's here. Trisha Briggs. Trisha! Come on down. Two more $50 gift cards from Divi. Oh my God. Man, Dale, the Divi guy's up to their game on Bill.com. <laughs> like, you no offense, dude, but like, their first year, you've been here how long? And they're bringing like, how many gift cards? I'm just saying. Okay, we got uh, Christy Davis. Christy! Christy Davis. And uh, I got another one, two, number one, two, here. One, one. 404-987-4406. Woo! Mary Margaret, there we go. It's still Bill.com I think those were... It's right still in the Bill.com budget. Great. Okay. Sorry, Sammy, there's so another have... price increase coming. <laughs> they just announced it's now $70 a user. I don't know what they're doing. So we have one awesome. more, is that right? One we got more? one more acuity one, right? Oh, oh, we two, got more. One. two more, sorry, two more. Two more acuity yep. ones. Tyler Horn. Tyler, Tyler, come Horn. on down. Is Tyler here? He is here. This is the first year Tyler has made it to the second day of AcuityCon. Chris. Welcome to day two of AcuityCon, Tyler. Yeah, this is Tyler's first ever day two of AcuityCon. It's a Yay! great 2019 story. Never drink really late at night with giraffe folks. <laughs> That's how you start it. You Tried can talk to push about it. Tried to brink last night. <laughs> yeah. but. All right. We got Christy Davis. Christy Davis. Yeah, again. again. All right. Are we good? <laughs> All right. She's like. <laughs> That's the wrap, y'all. One. Hold on. Wait. Sorry. One more thing. Hold on. Wait. Divi, Divi stood up. This is for the AirPods. Okay. The AirPods. Thank you, Thank you very much. So these are for the AirPods Pro. Um, <laughs> it's 44. Oh, sorry. 404 644 9387. Oh! oh! Matthew. Uh, if you got a, a, a gift card from me, text me because I send you the virtual gift card of it. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So thank you very much, everybody online that showed up for AQECON 2021. This is a wrap for that. Uh, thank you so much for our panelists. You guys are great. Our, our, everybody that came in, all of our tech tech partners, we really appreciate you. And everybody that came from Acuity, you're our favorite. <laughs> Don't tell the tech tech <laughs> partners. But, but that's awesome. Uh, a couple of logistic items. Uh, we have to flip the room for 1230 this room. But we've got, if you want to hang out at the community center across the hall where we had uh, lunch or breakfast the, the, the different two days, that'll be open if you need to hang out. If you need to do meetings and stuff like that, we work here. We'll find a meeting room for you for any of the employees or tech stack partners. But, but make sure to hang out. Oh, I forgot one more raffle. I brought a dozen uh, eggs, but I'm giving oh. them to Amanda Roberts. <laughs> so I got like a, I, I meant to be like oh like mysterious about it, but it was gonna be a, 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 a the fix was in because she like oh that reminds me of growing up and we had a, there's an egg story with Amanda Roberts, so that's all right. But I've got your eggs over there, Amanda Roberts. So, so, so I'm a chicken farmer now, but that's and a whole different story. I won my bet on whether Matthew could make it through AcuityCon <laughs> and not mention the chickens. I knew he would. There it is. So they're eleven beautiful chickens um, but that's about it for logistics thanks for coming we'll see you next year at AcuityCon 2021